here's the problem with Americans in general, the Westerners and even more general. We tend to cover all our bases, you know. We take all the insurance we can, and we we don't leave anything to chance, which often can be a hindrance in letting God work. You know, He wants us to like at least partially uh, leave something open for Him to do. You know, religious tend to live like this, and and it's very powerful. It's a wonderful experience when you're in a religious community that depends on 100% divine providence, and God comes through every day, every day. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God again. As always, I'd like to start our video by thanking all of you for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll be edified with what we've put together for you here. And it's truly a blessing to learn all these things with all of you in, in this episode. It's definitely going to be another interesting compilation about our faith, which will hopefully be useful for your own spiritual growth. And I thought I should kick this off with this from Father Joseph Iannuzzi. I think I should let you know that a couple of weeks ago, I read one of the comments talking about how we should prepare for the end times, whether we should be stocking up food and building shelters for protection. I then reminded the person of a video I made of what Father Iannuzzi said about this kind of thinking, that we shouldn't be afraid, and honestly don't really fall for the doom and gloom messages out there about the end times because as Christians we should always place our faith and hope in Christ, and not giving in to the fear created by the evil one. Anyway, here's one from Father Iannuzzi. Now we're living in very trying times, and I know a lot is being put out there in the press in terms of what the future holds for mankind. Certainly. There is a lot going on in the world around us that wants to stop the growth of Christianity. There's no doubt about it. Even the popes have spoken about this, including Pope Pius XI. He spoke of a common center that includes the secular press that is doing, using everything at its, its disposal and doing everything in its power to kill Christianity. And um, he called it a conspiracy, Pope Pius XI. He used those words, I'm not making this up. And he said there is truly a, war, a conspiracy at a global level going on right now. To, now this is back in the time of Fatima. Pope Pius XI. Uh, that was back then. Imagine it now. And he spoke of one common center. And this came from his encyclical on communism, which is spreading throughout the world. Now, and Pope Pius XI spoke of communism spreading its errors throughout the world, which Our Lady warned us of. And it started, you know, with the whole Bolshevik Revolution. And ironically, at the time of Fatima, there was a revolution going on in Mexico under Callas when they were sh when he shut down all the churches, and he was hanging priests on butcher hooks, massacring people in church while they were praying. At the same time, across the globe in Russia, you had Vladimir Ulyanovsk Lenin, who you know, started the Bolshevik Revolution, but Lenin, who was Russian, adopted this German Communist Manifesto and applied it to all the uh, curricula in the schools of R Russia and to the governance. So Russia seized all private property and made it its own and gave to whom it pleased, when it pleased, well, how it pleased. And this lasted up until 89 until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then when all this land that was seized just under a hundred years ago could go back to its rightful owners, well, it didn't. Well, we're living today in the effects, the post-communistic era. Communism is still alive, but it's not as it was at the time of Fatima or during the Second World War. It is coming from the Far East, not from the North anymore. It is coming from the East, and we have to be mindful and prepared without any fear, without any worry. And there's one absolutely beautiful story shared by Father Daniel Rehill about Mother Teresa that I'd like to share here with you. Somebody else who comes to mind who was incredibly uh, 
docile to the Holy Spirit was Mother Teresa, of course, Saint Mother Teresa, uh, as all the saints were, but in a particular way. She had uh, such grace that would flow through her. I remember um, when I was living in Manhattan, you know, she had several houses up uh, in Harlem in the Bronx, and she'd visit uh, all of her houses. And uh, one day she was um, in New York, and she, she did everything that she asked the sisters to do. There was nothing beneath her. You know, if she had to clean a bathroom, she'd clean a bathroom. If she had to go beg for the poor, she begged for the poor. And so one day she was out begging at one of the subway stops, uh, you know, Grand Central Station, I think it was. Uh, and there was a man coming down the escalator, you know, a very rich-looking man, you know, fancy suit. And um, I guess a, he was a professed atheist, although he actually hated God, so... He wasn't a complete atheist. If you can hate somebody, they got to exist. And he was approaching her, and uh, he just had such a, a disgust for her because she really did resonate the love of God. And she said to, uh, to him, as she was saying to all the people, do you have anything for the poor? And with that, he spit in her face. Can you imagine spitting in a nun's face? Uh, the hatred must have been so huge in that man's heart. And... Uh, because she was so conformed to Christ, she uh, took her veil and wiped the spit off. And then she said to him again, uh, that was for me. Now, what will you give for the poor? And she said it with compassion. And something miraculous happened in that moment. You know, this is the results of giving the Lord permission. He started trembling and he broke into tears. And what did she do? She hugged him. The man who had spit in her face was now being hugged, and the love of Jesus was coming through Mother Teresa to that man. And <clears throat> something uh, extraordinary happened. He, he found his way back to God. He found his way back to God, went back to church. But that wasn't the greatest work of the day. The greatest work of the day was that that might have been his last chance to get right with God. And she could see that. She wasn't going to lose the opportunity by uh, any sort of retaliation or uh, backhanded comment to him. She just loved him in his brokenness. That's what giving permission, that's what being united to, to God does. It allows us to uh, react as the saints would react, react as Jesus and Mary would react, instead of relying on our own fallen, broken nature. So it's a very important thing to be giving the Lord permission. We need to give him permission every day. The next clip will be a little bit longer than usual, and it's from Father Carlos Martins again. I've been sharing a lot of clips of Father Martins recently, and I really hope you're not tired of listening to him, because there's so much I've learned from listening to him, especially while putting these videos together. Uh, easily uh, one of my favorite popes, and when you look at Pius XII, what you typically see in the, in the photographs is a very serious... Uh, maybe even severe looking, maybe even stern looking man. And, you know, Pius XII was the face of the church during the Second World War. He was, he was kind of the counterpart, if you will, to Hitler for Italy and, and certainly for the Catholic world and, and, and even beyond the Catholic world. And, you know, that, that seriousness was a response to the time and the chaos and the injury happening throughout the horrific events of the Second World War. That face was given, his seriousness was a, a, his way of giving hope to people. Uh, that uh, he never broke down publicly with emotion. Uh, he was never excitable in the sense that he would allow uh, some irascible part to escape and thus induce perhaps a hopelessness uh, or, or a, a kind of hysteria, uh, which ultimately would be a loss of hope for his people. He, he commanded strength through that look. Uh, yet he himself was a profoundly gentle man, a man who loved animals. There, there's an endearing uh, set of photographs out there on the internet, which I forgot to include uh, in the post that I did, but I've since added them of him with his beloved canary sitting on his finger. And you can see 
uh, the, the seriousness is not there, and there's just a man loving his pet bird whom he adores. And Pius XII has been much, much maligned uh, in recent years uh, with the accusations that he didn't do enough to save Jews. The Jewish state itself acknowledged that he saved 850,000 Jews from death. Uh, but modern historians, uh, revisionist uh, historians, have brought forward the accusation that his failure to outright condemn the invasion of Poland or Hit Hitler's actions uh, was a failure and is, is a moral failure and it implies that he was complicit, he was in agreement with the action of Hitler, right? which, is, which is absolutely absurd. But Pius XII, what is uh, among the amazing things about him was the sheer breadth of his accomplishments in his papacy. So this was a man who absolutely internalized the life of Christ, uh, who was a man of duty and of service. And he, uh, besides promulgating a dogmatic definition of Our Lady's Assumption, uh, besides bringing forward liturgical revisions, uh, besides a, a profound number of Episcopal appointments that he made around the world, and of course taking on Hitler and so forth, he was also the Pope who canonized, and well, and beatified even before that. In 1947, he beatified St. Maria Goretti. Three years later, he canonized her. Uh, so uh, there, there are numerous stories of the gentleness and the humani humanity of this Pope. And you know you just oppose these with the seriousness of his face, and you know that seriousness was the the hope of of Italy and of the Catholic world during the Second World War. I firmly believe that the prophecy of Our Lady of Fatima, that 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 the grace that was brought about, that was inaugurated, that that was prophesied by her, uh, of of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, that. Uh, Padre Pio and Pope Pius XII were the two fists that she brought about to combat uh, Hitler, to combat communism, and, and to give a strength to the Catholic world, because these two gigantic figures did exactly that. And you know, uh, Pius XII, he, from the time that he was uh, Apostolic Nuncio, or, or the ambassador uh, to Munich, uh, and he, he had a housekeeper there, uh, Sister Pascalina, or Mother Pascalina, as, as uh, religious sisters are often called in Italy. And Mother Pascalina, uh, when he was then called back to Rome to become the Secretary of State, she followed him, and when he was elected Pope, she remained his housekeeper, personal secretary, and kind of, in a sense, a jack of all trades. Uh, she ran his charities during the Second World War, which uh, were, were in enormously needed and enormously taxing. So she was uh, an absolute powerhouse uh, during the time when he needed somebody to be that. Now, of course, she was um, a person who, uh, in those days, was, was young and had a lot of energy. She was significantly younger than him. And that proved to be such a great boon because as the Pope aged, you know, of course, you, you, as a Pope, you, you, you're working uh, two full work days each and every day. There, there are uh, signatures that are needed, there are permissions that are needed that no one else can give other than you. And, there, and there's always a great danger for a Pope in that situation where somebody comes in to visit and hands him a document, and we just need your signature here. And of course, he doesn't know what he's signing because of fatigue, because of age, uh, and so forth. So, Mama Pascalina uh, w became extremely protective of him. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the words of many, she ran the Apostolic Palace, uh, that no one got to the Pope unless they went through her. And so she screened everything. In fact, they called her La Popessa, the Popus, because of the power that she wielded. And, and uh, Pius XII uh, absolutely trusted her. And, you know, when uh, the, 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 the canary that, that he beloved, uh, when, when Pope Pius XII died, 
course, the law in those days, uh, John Paul II revised it, but uh, by sundown on the day that a pope dies, the apostolic palaces are locked. The apostolic palace, pardon me, is locked. All the doors are locked. And of course, it's more than just the pope that lives there, all of his staff and so forth. But those staff are out of bedrooms from that moment onwards. So whatever it, whatever it is that you need, you take it out because until in the, the next pope is elected and allows you into the apostolic palace, you, you, won't, you won't have access to any of that. And so there's, uh, there are shots of, of Mama Pascalina taking out boxes of things that she need, and you see her carrying the cage with the canary, because of course the canary would die, uh, being locked uh, for, for weeks uh, in the Apostolic Palace. But we have the hair that is the relic. She had believed in Pius XII's holiness uh, to such an extent that she thought to collect the hair. For the second part of this video, as you know, there will be no more clips from the priests. And for this half, I'd like to share something from Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. His reply to the question, is America tainted by Freemasonry? There's no audio recording of him addressing this, but instead he shared his answer on his blog. So please don't mind me reading the answer for you. And according to him, it is no secret that the U.S. Capitol building was dedicated in a Masonic ceremony by our first president, George Washington. One can see today the stone in the Capitol building commemorating this event. It reads, Late Masonically September 17, 1932, in commemoration of the laying of the original cornerstone by George Washington. The U.S. Capitol building formerly housed the Supreme Court, which is now located across the street. Many of America's most important civic leaders have been Freemasons, including 14 U.S. presidents and five chief justices of the Supreme Court. And it is worth noting that Monsignor Rossetti and his team have been a bit surprised at the extent of spiritual problems for individuals with a family history of Freemasonry. These individuals not uncommonly have a repeating generational history of similar dysfunctions. For some, it is the presence of a spirit of death. These families may have an abnormal generational history of suicides, homicides, early deaths, miscarriages, and abortions. And according to Monsignor Rossetti, the experience of exorcists dealing with these people is that individuals can be negatively affected by a generational history of Freemasonry. But this will also lead to another question. How about a nation? Our nation's leadership has been strongly influenced by this organization, which has been condemned by at least eight popes. As recent as 1983, the Holy See has said that the principles of Masonic organizations remain irreconcilable with the teachings of the Church and membership is forbidden. Could it be that we as a nation are tainted by such a history? Since Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973, there have been many millions of abortions. And in the wake of all that is taking place, our response must be fully Christian. In response to rage, we offer peace. In response to persecution, we forgive. In response to death, we promote love, reconciliation, and unity, which are constitutive of a culture of life. And please allow me to share another one from him, as he shared how one priest was slimed during an exorcism, so to speak. As he puts it, it was a rough case for sure, but much progress was being made and several team members of lady and priests were present for the sessions. For this session, the afflicted person's priest spiritual director was also present, which Monsignor Rossetti often encourages. It was, however, the priest's first participation in a solemn exorcism of a possessed person. According to Monsignor Rossetti, for solemn exorcisms especially, he would carefully screen who is in the room because they admit only mature Catholics who are strong in faith with a recognized calling for this ministry. And the first session can be a bit overwhelming, especially when there is a strong manifestation of the demons. Nothing can really prepare one to look into the face of complete evil. And so when the lengthy session ended, the exorcist, as always, prayed the cleansing and protection prayers. Then the team adjourned to the next room to meet and recap. The priest's spiritual director was present as well. At one point, the priest tried to speak but kept messing up his words. He said he couldn't think straight and had problems talking coherently. He was confused and added, I can't understand why my brain is not working. The exorcist then asked him about his symptoms in more depth, and the exorcist concluded, saying, It sounds like you've been slimed a term borrowed based on one popular movie. The exorcist reminded him of a movie scene when an evil presence went through a person leaving behind a slimy residue which mentally disoriented him. And the priest said, yes, it felt like that. So the exorcist then did another round of cleansing prayers for him and the entire team. These prayers for protection and the cleansing prayers at the beginning and end of an exorcism session are important and largely effective. But in tough cases, some demonic effects can break through 
At these times, a second round of cleansing is needed, and Monsignor Rossetti also added that as an exorcism team, they strive to practice their ministry with integrity. They are obedient to all that the church teaches and to the ecclesiastical superiors. It is important for them to stay under the umbrella of the church's protection, and they willingly do so. However, in particularly difficult cases, they still can get slimed from time to time and have some passing, limited, demonic symptoms. But as Monsignor Rossetti then said, they take it as a small price for being involved in the ministry. And they pray that their little sacrifices are an additional grace to the suffering people who come to them for help. Well then, I think that is all for this video, and I really hope all of you have learned a lot from the episode this time. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank your support of our other two channels, Daily Inspiration and Christians on YouTube. And as always, if there's any suggestion or feedback, please let me know in the comments below. And if you would like to support our works, there's a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.